Good afternoon. It is wonderful to see this lovely turnout for our talk this afternoon. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker before we begin. Can, can you hear me now? All righty. Ted and his late wife, Dale, came to our community in 2011 from Lynchburg, Virginia. He moved to Lynchburg from Westport, Connecticut, graduated from Woodbury Prep School in Virginia, attended Middlebury College for two years, and then graduated from Virginia Tech with an agricultural degree. He then studied banking at Rutgers University. Ted had an 18-year career as a bank executive, finishing as president of the bank, and then he retired to found a business valuation form. He was very active in his community. He was serving on the city council and served in the Virginia legislature as well. He has continued to actively serve his community here at the forest, serving on the RA Finance Board and on the General uh, Services Committee. And he's been on a number of ad hoc committees as well. He continues to contribute to our community and his current project is a garden and it's on the corner sort of of Forest at Duke Drive and the entrance to the second exit. And it is in honor and memory of his wife, Dale, who was also an active person here. She served as president of the RA board for two terms. In 1996, Ted was part of the founding group and was manager for many years of the 500-Year Forest Foundation, which will be the topic of his talk with us today. I'm going to ask that you hold any questions until the end and that you wait until you get a mic, okay? Thank you. Please welcome Ted Harris. Yeah, we're good. Good afternoon, everybody. I need to thank a few people before I start. Corinne Garrett, who is the new community life coordinator, prepared this slideshow for me. <clears throat> she couldn't be here today because she's in Atlanta at a relative's graduation from Morehouse. Elodie Bentley, uh, well, let me say to begin with, uh, my eyesight isn't exactly what it used to be. And so we decided that maybe the best way to handle this program was to uh, do, do an interview. Well, once I got a chance to see the slides, and put them on a piece of paper, I realized I could probably talk uh, from, from the printed material I had here. So that's what I'm going to do, but I thank Elvie so much for being willing to interview me and for making some good suggestions about content. The mission of the 500-Year Forest Foundation is to create future ancient forest. That's a lot to put your head around. But we work with private landowners who are willing to put a conservation easement on their forest that will prevent cutting at any time. Of course, there are exceptions, like say if a tree fell on a power line, <clears throat> that tree would be taken down but even firewood for the fireplace has to be cut from downed trees or downed wood of some sort. We are a CCRC, a continuing care forestation. What's the last word? Community. And uh, you don't have to be 65 to get in. You just start at any time you're the owner of the forest makes it a 500-year forest, or any time you happen to be born in that forest, 
So it's a great place to live if you're a tree because you know you won't be cut down as a teenager. <laughs> Let me see if I can work this thing now. Does that put up the next slide? Oops. Just a little fifth grade biology before we start. I don't think I need these things. You remember that the sun photosynthesis was a process of the sun falling on the plant and the plant pulling up water from down below and taking carbon dioxide out of the air. And there, that makes the sugars that the plant grows on. And the byproduct, of course, is oxygen. Uh, next time you are out looking at your favorite tree, Say thank you. They took carbon out of the air for you, and they put some oxygen in the air for you to breathe. That change it? Oh, that went too far. The most marvelous invention of all time biologically was a cyanobacteria. That's the bacteria, the green bacteria, that learned to take the sunlight and convert it into energy and support for itself. This green bacteria is responsible for us being here in a sense the planet would still be a rock pile, except for the seas, if it wasn't for that wonderful uh, green bacteria. And it has been traced back 3.2 billion years ago. So it's been here for a long time, and it's produced all our oil and gas reserves, because these, all these plants in the seas died eventually, and when they uh, converted them to the oil and gas. But the most amazing thing that I didn't know about until recently is that the plants incorporated this green bacteria, and that is the chloroplast in the leaf today. So the chloroplast has the DNA that's exactly like the green bacteria, and the rest of the tree has a different set of DNA. Well, there had to be a batch of inventions before we got trees. Did that work? Did we go forward? Okay. And uh, the trees evolved from, of all things, moss. So the moss came onto the earth approximately 400 million years ago. And uh, eventually it became a tree. And the first tree was, had a stalk to it and a fern-like uh, top to it. And uh, eventually, Cellulose was invented, invented, and lignin was invented to hold the cellulose together. And then a whole batch of other things had to be invented. Roots, not only to uh, supply the tree with food, but also to uh, uh, give it structure so, so it wouldn't fall over. And then seeds and finally leaves. And leaves weren't really invented for deciduous trees until about 142 million years ago. Seems like to me there's something else I want to say, but I don't know what it was. <laughs> this is the extent of the deciduous forest in the eastern United States. And so th 
this is the area that we could grow our 500-year forest foundation into. I would like to talk about the advantages of old growth forests. This is a scene from one of our forests in southwest Virginia. The water that falls on the forest, for the most part, is absorbed because there's little runoff because the forest catches and holds a lot of water. And the water that is there is drinkable. It's, it's made pure. Forests pull out a lot of pollution out of the air, and it's done in two ways. The very fine pollution is actually absorbed up to the stomata on the underside of the leaf where the leaf breathes, and then the trees capture a lot of the bigger stuff. And a big tree will absorb 70 times as much pollution as a small tree. It's a great place for biodiversity. Oops, up too quick. Biodiversity, when a tree falls down, it creates what's known as a pit at a mound. And that creates microclimates that uh, are a help to biodiversity. And of course, the bowl is stretched out over, over the ground, and eventually the worms and the bugs and the bacteria will reduce it to humus, which has a, a positive effect on building soils. This is the biggest biodiversity in the woods. Now, uh, what old growth forests do especially well is absorb vast quantities of carbon. One percent of the largest trees in the forest store 50 percent of the carbon, and that seems to be a rule of thumb. This information, by the way, is all from a brochure that I'll be glad to email anybody who wants to see it. It's put out by the Old Growth Forest Network, and they've uh, looked at this, uh, all the scientific evidence from around the world and produced it. And interestingly, uh, carbon is actually stored in the soils. And if the soils remained undisturbed, as they would in an old growth forest, it can, it can count for a significant amount. This is a graph from that brochure that shows the importance of large trees. The bigger the tree, the more carbon it can absorb. And I don't know whether I said it or not, but as long as the tree is alive, it is storing more carbon. This is one of our 500-year forests, and it is, it is also a nature preserve in Virginia. And it illustrates probably, as well as anything, what an old growth forest looks like. It has, of course, big trees. And if you notice, the man has his hand on a tree that's fallen on the ground. And it's, if you look past the big tree into the forest, you can see it, it has various aged trees in it. So an old growth forest is a multi-aged stand because the big trees that die and fall down create openings and knock a lot of uh, smaller stuff down. And so the forest, in effect, is re constantly rejuvenating. In 1716, the then governor of Virginia, Governor Spotswood, decided he would get a batch of his buddies together and 
go to the Blue Ridge and cross the Blue Ridge to see what was on the other side and to claim it for the King of England. The chronicler of that event was a fellow by the name of John Fontaine. And he said it was just amazing. It was like they were traveling through a park with really big trees in the park. And of course, that was the case because the Indians used fire to manage the woods, and they used fire. It produced berry plants for them to gather, and it favored the production of nut trees. In 1966, the Virginia Urban Forest Conference had a long-range planning session in Richmond. Now, I was a member of the Virginia Urban Forest Council at that time. And a, we, so you're tossing out ideas. And a group of us felt like, well, why don't we do something about old growth forests? Well, it certainly wasn't a, a focus of the Virginia Urban Forest Council, but six of us got together because we realized that only one quarter of one percent of the old forest existed. So that was one acre out of every 400 acres was still left with old growth forest. My ex-brother-in-law was a uh, lawyer at Hutton and Williams in Richmond. So I went to him and I said, George, can you help us get started? And he said, we will do all your legal work for you, and I will ask one of our environmental lawyers if he was willing to uh, help you. And fortunately, David Ledbetter was, and for years he did all our legal work, and then when I retired from the CEO position in 2014, he became the CEO for the next seven years until two years ago. Well, we had this problem. How, we had this idea, but how, how are we going to affect it? Uh, so I heard about... Uh, a fellow who put on old growth forest conferences. And uh, this is Bob Leverett and uh, uh, another fellow, Stan Water, who worked for the Virginia Forestry Department. And I went to the third old growth forest conference, which was in western Pennsylvania. And it featured the Cook Forest, which was an old growth forest. So I got to meet a lot of people who were interested in this uh, in old growth, and uh, I made some good contacts. So I thought, well, if this if this will work here, why don't we try it? And maybe I can get somebody in our area. So we decided, and Bob Levitt was going to be critical in this to have an old growth forest conference at Sweetbriar College in the summertime. And we got about 100 attendees. I, of course, I was hoping like mad that one of them would turn out uh, to be an old growth forest prospect, but it didn't work out. So I was really disappointed. But. One of the people at that conference was a fellow by the name of Fred Scott, and his mother owned a 2,500-acre spread called Bundaran Farm in, uh, in the Charlottesville area. And he said, I will invite people if you'll come on and come here and put a program on. So whoopee, we, I mean, we didn't know how that was going to turn out, but we hoped like heck it would turn out good, and it did. Here are, whoops, that's too far. Here are the owners of our first 500-year forest. 
which happened eight years after the uh, meeting in Richmond. This is 2004. And this is Hal and Gene Kolb. He was an English professor at the University of Virginia, and she was an amazing naturalist. Here we are, you know, when you've got your first forest, you're, you're spending a whole lot of time with them, but here we are. Uh, they have a huge deer problem and don't allow any hunting on their land. So we're trying to protect a future uh, deciduous tree, an oak or an ash, I don't remember which. Uh, but that was the only picture I had of them. Meet Bill Martin. He became our mentor. And Bill, uh, I met him at the Old Growth Forest Conference in uh, Pennsylvania. Bill was a professor of ecology at Eastern Kentucky University. They had their own uh, old growth forest called the Lucy Cornette Woods. In addition, Bill had been the Secretary of Natural Resources for the state of Kentucky. So he was a, a, a really good mentor, and he became a member of our board and stayed on the board as long as I was there. So he's going to lay out how we should do this thing. And uh, he says you need to get at least 100 acres, and there need to be a significant number of trees over 70 years. You're not going to start from scratch. Uh, you're going to, you're going to do, take advantage. And of course, in the foothills of Virginia, which a lot of these forests are, uh, it's very often the case that the, uh, uh, the big trees are on the upper reaches of the, of the land where loggers haven't gotten. Oh, I meant to tell you one other thing about the cold forest. Excuse me just a second. Let me go back to there. Uh, it was at one time an apple orchard. And years ago, the apple orchard went out of production. And they have right now tulip poplar trees where those apple trees were that are this big around. And I'm convinced that one day those trees will be as big as the poplar trees in the Joyce Kilmer forest. Well, of course, the site has to be the right uh, uh, condition. You're not going to take a place that doesn't have potential. And that's pretty easy to tell by. You can look at uh, how the site is functioning now. Then the other aspect that uh, Bill talked about was that you need to keep track of what's going on in these forests. So at the present moment, every 10 years, we do a, a botanical survey. Uh, in this case, it was done twice in this forest in the same year, in the summertime and in the fall. And it produced this sort of information. This is one of 11 pages of all the uh, flora in that forest. The first column is the family name for that plant, then the scientific name, and then the common name, and whether it's an invasive or native plant. And then the final column is its abundance and location in the forest. The big problem in our forests these days are plants that come from other continents. And uh, they don't bring their enemies with them. So the effect is that they grow unchecked. And we offer up to uh, $3,000 a year to any forest owner who uh, presents us with a, a plan to use that money to control invasives. I should say that when you have a group of forest owners like we do, some of them are quite proactive and some of them are not active in the least, and then you have some in between, so to speak. 
But the way I look at that is that over the next buku years, say three or four hundred years, there are going to be lots of different owners of, of each forest. And it's going to be interesting to see that history at some future time. I think that's for future residents. These are where our forests are in Virginia. Uh, the three out in southwest Virginia on the uh, Ridge Mountains. One of them you saw a picture of where that bear was. And there are 10 of them uh, in the central Virginia in three or four county area. And there are three along the bottom. One's on the B Bannister River, one's on the Dan River, and one's on the uh, Meharin River that flows in to eastern North Carolina. I want you to meet Barbara Coffey. She died a couple of years ago, and she left us a forest. So uh, if any of you all are good trout fishermen, this forest is on the north fork of the Thai River, and it's, it's available for you, I think. Just let me know if you want to buy it. <laughs> well, there is an advantage for the uh, forest owner because he's not cutting his trees. They can be appraised, and whatever the appraisal is, if it's uh, he can take $50 of it per acre. So if it's more than that, it's $50. If it's less than that, it's less per acre. And he can, uh, then he can take 40% of that and use it as a tax contribution. And he has 10 years uh, time to put it on a statement. So uh, that gives some sort of incentive. A uh, uh, forest owner has some expenses. He has to pay for this appraisal, and he has to have uh, good legal help, too. I would like to introduce you to our staff. This is Mary Elfner, our program director. She's a graduate of Warren Wilson College in environmental science uh, at Ash Asheville School, and she's got a Masters from the University of Georgia um, Forestry Department. She worked for Fish and Wildlife for a while for the Audubon Society, and currently she's the chairman of the Audubon Society in Richmond, Virginia, and a member of Lewis, the, a director of the Lewis Skinner Gardens. This is our current CEO, Chess Goodall. And he's not a teenager. He's in his mid-60s. Uh, he's a graduate of Duke, and he has a master's from Duke also. He's one of the premier commercial foresters in Virginia. That background picture there, I think you see snow behind him. His family owns a very rare spruce forest on top of one of the Allegheny Mountains in Virginia, and it's under easement to the Nature Conservancy. In the last two years that he's been president, we've doubled the number of acres from 2,000 to 4,000 in our forest. So we are really lucky to have him as our CEO. What goes on behind closed doors? I think the saying is, nobody knows. I want you to visualize the closed doors as if it was the forest floor. So what is known about what goes on underneath the forest floor? Fungi exist in great quantities. They've identified, scientists have identified 150,000 different species of fungi. 
and they estimate that there's six million, so there's a lot to still define if, that, if that's any truth in that. The fungi has a cooperative deal with trees. If you give me 25% of your sugar, I will make sure you always have water and the nutrients you need. So in effect, the whole forest is hooked up to these fungi arrangements. The fungi, you know, is composed of almost microscopic mycelia. And if you stretch those end to end, underneath your footprint in the forest, there will be 300 miles of mycelia. So that shows you how uh, immense everything is. I want to talk to you a little bit about Susan Samard, who was in her early years a forest scientist uh, for the province of British Columbia. She took uh, radioactive carbon and put it into Douglas firs and birch trees that grow together in the forest. And she found that uh, in the summertime, the birch trees were supplying carbon to the Douglas firs. And in the wintertime, the Douglas firs were, were supplying carbon to the uh, birch. She wrote an article about it called The Wood Wide Web. <laughs> and uh, it was published in Nature which, as you know, is a premier scientific uh, publication. As a result of that, she was offered a, a teaching job at the University of British Columbia. Several years, two years ago, she wrote this book, Finding the Mother Tree. She told about her experiments, and her, it's partly a memoir, uh, but she makes the case in the book that cooperation may be more important than competition. So it seemed, she seemed to be saying that, uh, well, we need to uh, relook at what Darwin said about the survival of the fittest. And of course, that created quite a stir, and some of her own uh, colleagues at the University of British Columbia uh, thought that, thought otherwise. But anyhow, that shows that more research really still needs to be done before we understand this. One thing she said was that the big trees can identify their offspring. And uh, she proved that some way, and I don't remember how she proved it, but anyhow, they looked after their offspring. They could tell what once were their offspring. Technology is going to change everything we do in the forest because the drones uh, offer us a huge advantage for keeping track of the forest. And uh, imagine, if you would, a drone flying over this forest and what I'm about to tell you is being done mostly with pine plantations, but uh, the drone can see where the holes in the forest that need replanting. They can also tell if any part of the forest is under stress or there's a disease problem any place. And there's an app now that can actually estimate or calculate, I guess it would be better to say, the amount of carbon in the forest. Uh, I think for us, at some future date, as our trees get bigger and bigger, it will allow us to keep track of any poaching that might be going on in the forest. But uh, this has not been invented yet, to my knowledge, but I believe eventually a drone will be able to gather information in the forest. 
And when that happens, we'll be able to, to take account of the bird populations by noticing their nests, which are significant to a particular species of bird. And also, we'll be able to uh, find out what uh, fungi we've got in the forest if we fly around after a, a warm rain, which, in which causes the uh, fungi to fruit with mushrooms. But uh, it's just going to change how we do it. We're going to be able to keep track of things in real time instead of doing it every 10 years. So all of a sudden, if, if we discover a new invasive, we can get on top of it right away. Well, that sort of finishes me up. Now, I'll be glad to answer any questions. I would like to tell you on the way out, there are some uh, uh, newsletters out there, and there are even some envelopes you can put money in if you want to. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of hats if you would like to wear, get a baseball hat. All right. I Can I ask you something first? Wait a minute. Let me, get, let me get prepared. OK. When you introduced the very first attorney there that you came across, you said, All right, in now, 1956. Talk in the microphone. Oh. I, I was wondering, do, uh, uh, when, when you introduced the very first attorney, you said that he was an ecological attorney at the law firm in 1956. That's really early for, oh, I thought you, I thought he said, ah. Uh, Guess my what? Mistake. Let's I can't get some hear good a thing you're saying. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to get some new batteries for this thing. Try it now. Are you there? Oh, I think I'm hearing you. I'm so sorry. I should have been better prepared. My question, can you hear me, Ted? Can you hear him? What? Can you hear him? Can you hear me? Can All right. Is she talking into the microphone? I'm trying. OK, good. Could, could you say something about the difference regarding carbon capture in conifer forests and deciduous, because most of what I've heard about and read about has to do with deciduous forests. I'm not able to say anything about that. I'm sorry. I don't know that this brochure I'm talking about is, uh, has that information in it, but I'd love to send you that brochure if you'll send me your uh, uh, email address, I will send it to you. Ted, yeah. does the foundation work with the Nature Conservancy? 
Do uh, you have similar goals? Well, they're, how might they're, they differ? they're in a different league than we are. Uh, we have talked to them from time to time. As a matter of fact, at one time, I thought it might be a good idea if the Nature Conservancy uh, took us over. And I went to talk to somebody about that, but they, were, they weren't interested. But this was 15 years ago. But things are going so well for us now, I can't believe that that's a possibility. Ted, um, you mentioned, rightly so, that after a number of years, obviously different owners would be there. When you set these forests up, is there a permanency to the legal agreement so that a subsequent owner has to keep? Absolutely. It's, uh, it's absolutely the way it's going to be. It's forever. Now, you know, maybe we'll change the laws in this country one day, but for at the moment now, it's forever. Ted, I got sort of two questions to ask you. One is, uh, uh, is there any limit on the lower limit on the size of land that can be set up? And the second question goes to that too. Are there any, shall we say, forests? that have in-holders still in them that you're looking to maybe pick up in the future? You know, I'm not, I'm not hearing you well enough. Are you talking right into the microphone? Yep, I hope I am. Wh what did he say, Paul? I didn't catch your question. I'll just, I'll just come up here real close and you can ask it. I uh, was asking first, is there any, what is the smallest uh, forest that you would accept in your, in your program? This thing is not picking that thing up. Come closer and put that thing down, just tell me what you got by. Ed, I was asking you if, uh, what is the smallest amount of land that you will accept into your program? 100 acres. 100 acres? 100 acres, yes. All right, do you have any forests that have end holders inside the area that you may be looking to take this amount and later get your hands on the other? Others? Well, it's interesting. I, I really think that over a period of time, the uh, forests that are close to 500 year forests, some of the owners will. Uh, uh, volunteer to, to make theirs 500. I, I expect it to expand out from where it is, but I don't know that that's what's going to happen. Can you hear me, Ted? I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I recently read a book by Michael Pollan called Second Nature in which he asserts that the idea of preserving wilderness is a little bit misleading because we have already introduced invasive plants and altered our forests in enough ways that really a forest, every forest requires some degree of management. Now, you made reference to the problem of invasive plants and looking for solutions, but can you comment on whether forests in this 500-year forest program are managed in some ways, and if so, how? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, I look at uh, our forests as uh, being managed to some degree, depending on the landowner. I know when I was working with some of the forest, if I worked with somebody that was helping that forest and didn't involve the landowner, it was a waste of time. The landowner has to, it's, it's his forest, and it's necessary for him to decide, him or her, you know, to decide what should be done in the forest. And uh, some of them are just a whole lot better at it than others. And so uh, how this will eventually work out over the long term, I don't know. I suspect 
that um, if we begin to use drones, we will uh, have more management help for the forest owners, and that'll make a significant difference. How far reaching is this organization? How far reaching is the organization? You seem to be focused here in the South. Uh, do you go uh, all over the U.S. for your forests? How far reaching are you involved? Is it the entire United States or? Just, just Virginia right now. But it, we, uh, we have, they, of course, I'm not actively involved with it anymore. So I find out my thing secondhand. But um, we have just hired a, uh, a planning consultant. And uh, they're going to come back with recommendations for the, for the foundation. And um, I suspect one of the things I want to see them do, I want to see them expand in other states. Uh, but uh, I had hoped that that information would be ready, but they say it's not going to be ready till June, so I couldn't include it in my talk. Ted, uh, who, uh, how much money is involved each 10 years when you have to do a full inventory of the, of the forest? And who pays for that? Well, the c contributors end up by paying for it. Uh, and how much money, I don't know what that particular, uh, um, the one I showed you, I don't know what that costs. My, my guess is it costs four or $5,000, but I, I don't know. Ted, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. The invasive species problem, I'm wondering what you've learned about it, because I had a $40,000 grant to get rid of the invasive species on our property. It's a very complicated process. We did it, but none of the neighbors did. And the invasive species were back within a couple of years. Uh, it's, it, <laughs> I know exactly what you talk about. This particular forest owner that I showed you the botani botanical species um, from has that very same problem. Uh, uh, and uh, he would very much like them to be as conscious of the invasive species as he is. Uh, but they're not. As a matter of fact, it's on the side of a mountain, and a poultry operation bought the land and consult, uh, constructed a poultry operation on the side of the mountain, which just seems to me to be ridiculous. But you, you know you can't do anything with your neighbors if, they, if they're not uh, in, into it, too. But that makes it more challenging. Well, I think that's enough. Thank you all so much for coming today.